I move quietly, like a shadow, there's a dark side to me. I work privately to go build and create my own dynasty. A new rivalry, it emerges ever so silently. But I got fight in me, so I squash anything that's trying me. I'm like, me versus you, I hope that you know what you're getting into. I got nothing to lose, so you better watch out, can't predict my moves. I'll make you irrelevant, I don't stop till I'm at the top settling. I live here like a local resident, and you know I ain't selling it. Hello everyone and welcome to the podcast. I hope you are excited to tune in and to listen to our conversations as much as I am excited to bring this to you. So please sit back, relax and enjoy the show and if you like it, do share, like and subscribe. So let's get started. This is Ambo and welcome to the Bhutanese Talk, the show that brings to light the concerns and issues faced by Bhutanese. I'm your host, Dr. Chodhan. A little bit about myself. I grew up in Bhutan, Bangladesh, India and the US. I attended Yangchen Puhaya Secondary School and at the age of 16, moved to New York where I completed my high school education. I graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Management and Economics from Stony Brook University in New York. And as a fresh graduate, sat for the RCAC examination like every other graduate, unsure and a bit worried. I always had an interest in the teaching profession and although at that time it became very clear to me that teaching was not the first choice of any graduate and despite the fact that I did well in my exams, I decided to stick to my instincts and selected the teaching profession. As trainees, we were sent to the Samthi College of Education where I spent four fabulous months. However, life had other plans and I got accepted into the doctoral program in Texas and left to pursue higher studies. In 2013, I graduated with a doctoral degree in international business with concentration in information systems from the University of Texas at El Paso. And for the last 10 years, I have been teaching business courses in the US to undergraduate and MBA students. And I've lived with one foot in the country and one foot outside. As an outsider, I've been able to see the changes taking place over the years. However, as an insider, my knowledge of the everyday life of a Bhutanese has been very limited. Therefore, my main goal for doing this podcast series is to learn more from Bhutanese who are living and working in the country from different fields. I hope to be a medium to convey the message to our leaders who can then implement the right changes for the betterment of our economy, whereby we can uphold the developmental philosophy of cross-national happiness coined by our beloved fourth king of Bhutan. My guest for episode number two is none other than Karma Kelvin Dorji, a well-known philanthropist who has selflessly helped many disadvantaged and the elderly across the country. His work has amassed public admiration and a huge following on social media today. He has emerged as a youth icon, a social media influencer, but he still comes across as someone who is grounded and approachable. He has a Facebook page by the name of Kito Photography Vlog, which journals the service he renders, and through this, he has brought many issues and cases to light that perhaps many Bhutanese were not even aware of. In today's episode, we will learn from KK about his upbringing, his mission in life, the challenges he has faced, and about some of the service he has rendered to the disadvantaged. This episode was recorded at a local business in North Tipu, hence my apologies for the background sound, which is just the natural hustle and bustle you hear at any public space. This is Ampo, Karma Kelvin Doji. Can you share about your childhood and upbringing with our audience? La? This is Ampo. Thank you so much for having me here. My name is Karma Kelvin Doji and I'm here to share about my upbringing as a child. And I just want to tell you that I was very young when I was uh, age was six, seven. My mother passed away. After that, my dad has brought second wife and sent us to monastery to be a monk. And we were in the monastery for several years and been there without a parent's love, which we still don't understand what is mother's love. And we, I have never seen mother properly and never felt the love of mother in my life. And my father wants us to be, and he sent us to the Shigong monastery and I was there for 11 years as a monk. I hear that you were adopted at a very young age. Would you be able to share a little bit about that experience, Lord? Yeah, it was quite lucky for me and my brothers since I have never experienced the true love from my own parents, but God has given us opportunity to have our godparents from Sweden who gave us a good platform to us to 
be where we are today. They took us and they really gave us the foundation of life. And she was very loving and caring. And she asked me, would I like to stay with them? I said, no, I am. I was not interested. But I have seen the love from the godparents. They really loved us and cared us. And that was the opening door for my me and my brother and we got that opportunity to uh, feel the love from her as for your own mother and that was a big uh, change in our life. Now you're quite popular in Bhutan, you help the disabled, the disadvantaged, the elderly and you're very active in different parts of Bhutan. Would it be fair to say that your childhood experiences, both the negative and the positive, has somewhere motivated you to help others love? I think it is a great opportunity for me to be on social media here in Bhutan and to be as an example to the young generation. I never planned to be popular or I never thought of being popular, but people love me the way I do things and bring up to our society. In my childhood time, negative and positive, that gave me a huge big uh, opportunity to learn to do something today to help my people. I challenge myself to help people who are disabilities and people who are, are old age people like in the villages. I try to reach them. That was something that, that turns me off when I was a monk, young age, and I so struggled myself. That really gave me the way to open myself to reach my people and my country and that really changed me. Now I hear that you're very popular on social media on all these different platforms like Facebook. I myself, I do not use TikTok but I've watched uh, random videos that are shared often on other social medias. Now when did you start using TikTok and who influenced you to join Love? The TikTok was a huge big opening platform for me. I came on TikTok because of my younger brother called Pema Bhutan. I saw he was on TikTok many times and I never understood. I was just felt like they were wasting time or something. But he said, come on TikTok and, you know, you can really bring lots of encouragement to youth. Uh, he knows that we've been doing this one from a long time back. But TikTok was inspired by my brother and my brother's friends and they gave us opportunity to come on TikTok to able to achieve what we are doing today through TikTok. Now, TikTok is a very popular social media platform. Besides being able to reach the mass through TikTok, I believe you can also raise funds via TikTok, which you are then able to use in your mission to help the disadvantaged. Who was the first person you helped through TikTok, La? I think TikTok is a one app that I saw in Bhutan, which really benefits lots of young people who are jobless. And also, especially in my work, TikTok gave us lots of opportunity to earn uh, money. Uh, we've been earning more than six to seven thousand dollars for a few months. Through that money, we try to reach out to people who really need our help. TikTok is also a platform where you can really communicate with young people to influence them what are good and bad. And that's why in Bhutan, many young people coming on TikTok, they are somehow earning some money to able to leave themselves and do something and that's why our project started through tiktok earning huge amount and my first project through tiktok was building a home for old men in temple out of temple and we built all men's home we also provided all his necessary things and second one was in monga we built a shop for a girl a disabled the worth of one like twenty seven thousand then next was we did it at Wamrung, building a home for the debt men, the worth of one like eighty. That's all the money which we earn on TikTok, and that really helped us. In your own words, la, what would you say is your mission or purpose in life, la? My purpose for life is to able to open other people's eyes to see the proper light and enjoy the proper food and also that they can really feel the worth of being human and this is something i don't have any other agenda to love one another and bring a smile on their face and this is our agenda to help people around we want to see everybody having a food to eat and home to live and also clothes to wear yeah. Today you have with you a team of young Bhutanese adults who work to achieve this goal. I'm curious to know how did this team form love? 
we have young people who are working with us numbers of very young people from age of 15 to 20 i can say that it's almost 60 young people working with us and that took us huge effort to gather that big group these young people are really motive and they really want to serve they want to do something they really want to, to challenge themselves to show what they can really do and serve for the country and that's why we teach them not to uh, go into a wrong way becoming better person we always want them to encourage themselves to fight back and in a good spirit and we have a huge number of young people are really working hard and we will be keep on doing this work continuously and our members are growing more and more in the near future, do you intend on forming an NGO? And currently, would you say your team kind of functions like an NGO lab? We have that dream to form an NGO. And it's not easy to form an NGO at the moment. But our work is kind of a more than an NGO sometimes, I believe. We do it on ground level, door-to-door -door service, to able to understand the sorrow of the person, the pain that person is going through to listen their stories we don't need any document to submit to us to able to help that person we wanted to go ourselves and spend time with them and see what we can do and sometimes i believe that if we really depend on kind of ngos and something like that would be really not reaching individual people's life to help and of course we want to follow rules and regulation to able to form ngo that's our dream it is my understanding that uh, you have helped quite a lot of disadvantaged and disabled individuals so far from different parts of Bhutan, from remote areas. I'm wondering what kind of help are you currently able to provide for them now? Most of our help is to reaching them food items and people who are disabled with uh, diapers and numbers of uh, diapers and huggies I think and also we try to go there ourselves and hand over some cash money to able to buy them and sustain for a few months mostly is that we really are going there and delivering food clothes and also medication help uh, we're trying to listen to their stories and see what is most needed and when it comes to disabled, we reach out mostly diapers which they really need it because they cannot go to the toilet able to pick themselves or work themselves. The diaper is most needed. That's why we've been delivering. In total, roughly speaking, how many individuals would you say you have helped till date? La? So far, if we include with reaching out to people who are in meditation centers in different parts of Bhutan, I think we have crossed almost uh, 200 plus plus people, families. We believe that numbers are not that important for us. For us is that improvement and the support which we given them really that they are using in a proper way and they are recovering with their health or at least they are getting something from our team. We believe and not to count numbers, we believe to bring an improvement the person which we are helping uh, and to sustain in the future by themselves. Now I'm sure no matter what you do, as they say, you cannot make everyone happy. What kind of feedback have you received from the public and uh, do the negative comments affect you, La? When we come on social media, what I have learned is to digest the comments which they really post on negative on us. Uh, we have been lots of people saying what not to us and, and sending messages personally. What I've learned something is that ignorance is the best thing. As there's a way of saying cheers up, these up. And there's always uh, when some good things happen, the devil is always there to stop the goodwill. Mm -hmm. And I believe that mm, there are lots of people jealous about our work. Uh, instead of helping, people try to stop our work and that makes us really feel sad. But we are never give up what we are doing. We will keep on doing. We see the blessing. We count the blessing, not the sorrows. And that's the thing that we are doing today. And also, the people who give us bad comments also. I think we try to take it positively. We learn it positively and see what are the changes that we can bring it through the, the uh, bad comments. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I think it's uh, human nature to say what not. But sometimes it's really also harms not only me, my family, mm -hmm. my children asking, have I done something wrong? Mm -hmm. But otherwise, many people understand what we have been doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to prove to the people who have negative comments to us. Only God himself can really show them what things have we done. And we'll be 
Happy you. I have seen some videos of you and your team in action helping and uh, some of these conditions of uh, the individuals are just heart-wrenching and uh, some are of course heartwarming and some it was a bit hard to see visually and to digest. What would you say was the worst condition you came across till date? La? As a Buddhist, as a believing of Buddha and practicing Buddhism, I believe that we should speak less and act more. What I went through, there was an old man sleeping in the bus station for months, more than a month, full of wounds on all over the body, suffering more than a hell, and that really touched me, and that really gave me goosebumps to see when we picked him from the bus station to the hospital. Even today, we are looking up to him in the hospital. His health condition is wrong. The bus station was stinking. He was really stinking. Everything was rotten. And that really made me feel very sad that we practice what we believe, but we don't act what we believe. And that, that was really heart-touching for me mm -hmm. to see. Now, as you mentioned, we are followers of the Buddha and helping others is a noble deed. However, it can also be expensive. What has been the most expensive help or assistance you have given La? I think we all have to understand one thing is that we are watched by God and the how much it costs or how much we earn, how much we are investing doesn't matter. If we put our effort and money to the person which they get a change in their life and bring up something joyful in their life, that is more important than thinking about how much you are giving. But so far our team has spent it one like eighty was the more expensive, one like twenty seven was expensive, one like forty was expensive, but we have never thought about expensive. We always thought to bring a change. We always thought that somebody's getting help out of what we earn and what we are getting out of it. And I don't think that we should keep that greediness for our help wealth. Mm -hmm. If we cannot finish ourselves, why can't we share with other people? That's why we've been sharing and we'll be... That's the something that I have learned through sharing is a lobby. Mm -hmm. I must say that the service that you render to our Bhutanese brothers and sisters is indeed noble and impressive. But how do you intend to sustain this in the long run, La? We have a small center here in uh, Pamcho, a house which we rent 15,000 a month. And we have everything which we needed uh, for the people living here with the disability boys who are away from home, from Tashigang, Tashiangsi, uh, who cannot go back to their hometown and to live there because their family cannot help them uh, due to their financial background. And they have no place to stay in Thimpu. We have rented house for them. And also they need to go to hospital because hospital is nearby. And that money comes from Norway. The one woman supported uh, to pay rent. And also we are giving them diapers. And also we are giving them uh, monthly support to them this is in long run we are trying to teach them to use tailoring to able to sew themselves and sell it uh, this kind of small training we are trying to give them now currently as you mentioned you have workers however with a lot of the youth and the individuals leaving the country for greener pastures i assume it will be a challenge in the near future to sustain workers so currently in a month approximately how much would you end up spending on the salaries la? we don't have a proper salaries boys who are working with us but we try to give them as a gift putting data and also pocket money to go up and down the car to able to use that money in a proper way I think we have been spending money almost uh, one lakh plus uh, in a month sometimes uh, when we include giveaway to people who are needed for our help. Uh, otherwise, our boys are not that greedy to have salary or everything. But most of the thing what I've seen in my boys is very faithfulness to work and also to see and to really want to give their heart. And that was more important that I saw. But We've been spending uh, quite a lot of money which we earn from TikTok and through people who are supporting from Australia and from the US and also different parts of the world, our own Bhutanese. That money we are spending in the proper way. We don't spend to go enjoy it, go to a party or something. We have never taught our boys to do that and it, myself also, I don't enjoy going to party. But otherwise, uh, we are spending money into the proper places. 
Yeah. So as I had mentioned earlier, I saw some videos of you and your team traveling to remote areas to provide help and assistance to the disadvantaged. For example, recently you and your team, I saw that you guys traveled outside of Thimpu and built toilets for the elderly. I'm wondering how the planning process works. Is the execution smooth or chaotic? How do you keep track of the activities you do, the finances, human resources, travel shopping for materials, etc.? Thank you for the question. I think uh, what we do is that uh, once we get information that the grandma needs uh, help from us, mm -hmm. we try to find out from the local uh, leaders, is it really true that she needs help or not? What are the procedures to help her? And according to that, we try to take a chance to go with certain things and also recruit our team together to see who are the talented with the carpenters and everything. We go really early morning, 4 a.m. to go there and drive ourselves and spend time there and see what are the things that we can change it. And ourselves, we don't spend lots of money to building our things. We try to do it ourselves by digging and also cutting wood and everything we do it ourselves. That really, it goes very smoothly with team. The most important thing is that it's something which I've learned is we have a team unity. Everything agrees together and we all come together and expenses are always there. But we, since we get a budget from organizing from different parties and also organizing different fundraisers, we could really help the need of that woman. She was suffering. Her toilet was worse and that would, could we help her. Since you go on a lot of trips and you've interacted with the youth of Bhutan, what issue do you feel affects the youth of our country the most? And what help do you think they need the most love? I get lots of opportunity to go around and visit people and talk with the youth. And I really see the problem that we are facing in our country is the job. First of all, that there are a lot of problems. The youth are not getting a job. Once they get a job, then it's so difficult to say that you need experience for years and years to able to participate with that job and i think many youths really going through lots of difficulties and also some jobs are good but is uh, very less and that's why i think many youths are giving away and trying themselves to go to australia and australia has become a kind of a heaven for our people in Bhutan now. Every young wants to fly there and that should not be a reason to leave our country because of the jobless. And I think we need to find out the ideas to how to implicate to a young youth to work and to bring a change and also to open door for the young people more to see that we can work in our country instead of going away. And that was the biggest challenge that every young used to say there's no work, no job and mostly are getting into the problems after when they don't have job. Now, being a woman myself, I'm curious, have you come across any females or children in vulnerable conditions and what help did you render to them, La? So far that uh, our work has been mostly with women. Many, when we met them, mostly saying that there has a problem with husband or husband has gone to jail or the children is suffering, cannot support themselves, then laying down on the park, cannot feed their children, cannot go home. And mostly women has a very much difficult situation so far that I have faced. And what we are doing is we have a woman we are helping at the moment. Uh, two, one is eight month children and one is three years old. We are trying to help them with every necessary items from our side. And at the moment, the child, eight months in the hospital, uh, trying to get recovered. Since mother couldn't help to uh, support the children, the children was lying down on the park for a few days. And now the children's uh, health condition is worse. And also we have other women. Her husband has gone jail. Then one disabled children at home has been tied in with the roof and cannot go out. The mother had to go and do shopping with the vegetable, everything. We are helping with the rent and also every month a few thousand to buy food. And we are looking for the longer term how we can really sustain and help them. Not only giving away, but we want to give them opportunity to earn themselves and see what they can really bring change. This is what we have been doing with the women so far. With our upcoming Bhutanese elections, if you could request our politicians to focus on some areas, 
what is the most important change you would like to see now? I would really ask our politicians, leaders to change is that there are many things to be done, but everything is not in their hand too. And also what I really want to tell them is that there are lots of disabled person all over the places in our country. Most thing is that they don't get help. Second of all is they cannot do it themselves because of there is no any way to do it themselves. Example, they cannot go with their own wheelchair. The roads are not properly constructed for the wheelchair. They cannot go to hospital themselves because there is no any other way to get to hospital. Many in other countries, many disabled, they cook themselves, they do it everything themselves. This is not here in our country. Why? They need to rent house. The house doesn't have a lift. They have somebody have to carry up. And these things are really much uh, disturbing. And today, for young politicians are coming with different ideas and everything. Our request is them to see and integrate that uh, rules and regulation to bring a change to these people. Uh, they need to uh, get a really help. They are the one who really uh, the politicians should uh, focus on bringing change, not only bringing change for roads and construction or something. I think the human needs accessible thing to able to live a, a good life especially these wheelchair people even in Thimpu you go to hospital wheelchair people cannot go themselves they need somebody to carry them and that was the biggest challenge that I faced. Now apart from the social work that keeps you busy I believe you also run your own business could you share what you do now? Yes I do run a travel agent uh, my travel agent called Open Tours Bhutan Tours and Tech I've been running this for a long time now uh, we have a best office in Sweden and Germany and we've been bringing tourists from different parts of the world and also I run a hot stone bath here in Thimpu and we have our own house here in Thimpu we try to sustain from that business it's so difficult to live in Thimpu uh, if you don't have work and your income and this is something that uh, we have been doing even from our travel business we invest money to people who really need it. Uh, like sending to rehab, sending to like uh, what's called like children who really needs our help. We try to help from there. We even have lots of ex monks living monastery. We try to help them when they come to Thimpu. Well, many people think that we are living through the collection of the money to helping people. No, we have our own business. We have uh, enough to live and enough to sustain ourselves with our family here in Thimpu. Now we've come to the end of the interview. I would like to know what do you do in your free time, la? That is when you get some free time, la? I hardly say that we have free time, but uh, most of the time when you go here and there help people, I think it's like a more than a free time for us. We get so much peace in our mind. Also, we encounter lots of anxieties and lots of things when we see our people we meet with their health condition and lots of people going through lots of difficulties. We get lots of uh, what's called attacked by a mentally problem too but we are trying ourselves we try to hang around with our boys but not at going at night and going for party or enjoying what we do is we hang around together we go and eat together and watch soccer together this kind of thing that we spend time together we don't have a proper kind of a free time we don't make a plan to have a free time it happens sometimes watching football together and that's all our free time looks like and also few times that i spend with my family children they need to see me and this is something that i spend time with my family most of the time with this we come to the end of episode number two i would like to take this opportunity to thank karma kelvin dorji for making time for us and i would like to thank him for all the work he has done and is currently doing as we all know this is no easy task if you would like to connect with karma kelvin dorji i have all the details in the description box below i hope you enjoyed episode number two and i look forward to meeting you again in episode number three Thank you for tuning in and have a great day everyone. I move quietly like a shadow there's a dark side to me. I work privately to go build and create my own dynasty. A new rivalry hit emerges ever so silently. But I got fighting me so what's squash anything that's trying me. I'm like me versus you. I hope that you know what you're getting into. I got nothing to lose so you better watch out can't predict my moves. I move quietly like a shadow there's a dark side to me. I work privately to go build and create my own dynasty A new rivalry, it emerges ever so silently But I got fighting me, 